Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And you know what? If you've ever wanted to know what it was like to go from secondary school teacher to full-time investor and business owner, then guess what? Today's a conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very last word, because Today's guest has some very unique insights. You know what? Things like, well, right out of college, uh, he became a teacher. He also saved money to buy properties every year as part of that after getting out of college. He also quit his job and is now an active as well as passive investor in over, hold on to your, hold on to your seat, in over a thousand doors in eight different locations, which we love that here in the Going Long Podcast. And you know what? It may be even over many more doors than this, but he'll give us the update. Don't worry. He also uh, owns as well as partners in a virtual assistant business. And he is also the founder of Padalano Investments. And he's the host of the super popular podcast, the Cashflow Kings podcast. Gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Frank Padalano. Frank, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me, sir. Yes, you guys have definitely done some research already. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we like to do that. We like to do that, which is uh, which is great. And I'm super looking forward to uh, to having another conversation with you. I know I've had a chance to do uh, a couple of conversations since we met at the uh, Mid Atlantic yeah, Multifamily Investing Conference with uh, Mr. Myers there a couple months back, and uh, it's been uh, fantastic getting to know you, Frank. So, listen, as you know. Everybody gets the same five questions here, and then we're in the middle. We're going to, you and I have a nice little conversation so that the uh, Going Long family can get to know you even better. But let's kind of get things started off. First and foremost, where is it that you live in the United States, Frank? So I live in uh, New England. I live in Rhode Island. Uh, I could give you the exact city, but one of the big jokes about Rhode Island is it's only 37 miles by 45. So we only have 39 cities and towns. So, and I know everyone. So. <laughs> The small you know, place. You, you know everyone and they know you. So um, <laughs> each of the towns, of course. Um, so fantastic. So appreciate that. What is also, what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours, Frank? Sure. So I was uh, at a local store and uh, just talking to one of the employees and um, come to find out he owns his own business uh, during the day. This is, this is his night job. So uh, he owns his own little restaurant in uh, in downtown Providence. So uh, after this, I'm probably going to stop there for lunch and surprise him. Come on in, uh, t take a few pictures, promote his brand a little bit, and just go from there. You know, you always try to help out other business owners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that is absolutely phenomenal. And being able to do that, give that little surprise, I'm sure it's going to put a great uh, big old smile on their face. And then when you uh, share that love across uh, your social media channels, which is all over the place, if people haven't already seen you, you should definitely check it out. And if you're not watching the video version of this, everyone, if you're just on your treadmill or something, stop just for a couple seconds and at least check out the video version, go over to YouTube and you'll see this really cool cash flow Kings in the background. So, uh, which will be awesome. So listen, Frank, I always try to give at least a couple of kind of high level ideas about who the guest is. And I shared a couple of things that, as best as I could tell it, but I can never tell your story as best as you could. So one of the things I would really appreciate is if you could share your own backstory and your own words with the Going Long family. And also if you could along the way, Frank, if you could maybe just also highlight some of the really important decisions that you've made or actions that you've taken to get to this part of your journey. And then afterwards, you and I will kind of take it, uh, take it forward from there. Wow, that's that's a powerful statement because I'm just thinking about we all make decisions uh, each and every day. And while some of them feel very small when you first start them, as you continue to do them, it's like, wow, that really changed your life. You know, just like uh, maybe uh, your trip to uh, Europe, stuff like that, that, that first time. Yeah, it was supposed to be a one, <laughs> it's supposed to be a one year sabbatical 20 years ago. There yes. you go. <laughs> yeah, so, so when I started out... Um, 
I was uh, thinking about going to college for uh, business, and instead I went for uh, education. I became a teacher. Uh, my dad uh, died when I was in high school, and uh, one of the big things he pushed for me to do was to get that safe, secure job. And uh, as you guys know, business is not always safe and secure. So uh, teaching pretty much is in many ways. I mean, I'm not saying it's not stressful. It's a, it's a hard job. There's a lot of grading and dealing with parents and kids and changing people's lives every day. But um, overall, it's with unionized and everything else, it's relatively safe and secure. And uh, plus, my girlfriend at the time uh, was going to be a teacher too. So I said, what the heck? Let's do it. And uh yeah, so I became a teacher, and uh, at the same point, we kept. Uh, I actually, I eventually married her, and uh, each each and every day, you know, we're out there working five days a week. There, um, I had a second job, and uh, just you never know when you could get laid off. And uh, for the first few years, especially with budget cuts, et cetera. And what happened was, is that we started to generate uh, a decent amount of cash. And uh, while in 2005 or so, cash was paying pretty well at that 6% or 5% number, um, that didn't last forever. So uh, we had to decide uh, what we we're going to start doing with that money. And as you know, Billy, uh, you could either uh, donate it, you could blow it all on some nice boat or you could invest it. And uh, I thought investing was probably the way to go. And uh, that was part of the journey. And then, so we bought our first house. Uh, I actually bought my own residence at the top of the last cycle. Uh, the price of our house dropped at least 33%, but we put down 25%. So we're only a little underwater. <laughs> and then, um, but at the bottom of the cycle, we started to buy some smaller multis. And we started out with, uh, you know, one or two uh, small properties a year. And uh, now we're doing, we're doing the same thing now, but usually it's bigger, just bigger properties. And sometimes it all depends on the opportunities that are thrown in front of us. Uh, sometimes we'll do four or five deals in one year. Other years, we might only do one or two. Mm -hmm. you, you, so uh, I'll give you advice right now. Uh, don't worry about fear of missing out. You got to... There's, there's nothing wrong with passing on that bad deal. It might be one of the best decisions that you make. Yeah. So, so recognizing when to, to pass on a deal or whether you're going to buy one deal or two deals or four or five deals, I guess a couple of the things that just have kind of stood out to me in terms of there are a number of different questions I want to ask you, of course, but no problem. Um, so one of the things is you mentioned that now you're at a point where, you know, some years you buy one or two and some years you buy four or five. Can you maybe help us to understand? Because sometimes people are not really crystal clear on what their criteria are and they just know that they want to buy. So how do you help yourself to know when some years it's going to be one or two and another years it's going to be four or, or five? Yeah, so I don't always know at the beginning of the year, obviously, what the what the what it's going to be it's you just look at each deal individually and the main thing you have to do is you have to make sure i mean the whole point of real estate investing is to make money so uh, it's kind of funny because we had a uh, we had a podcast that we posted and uh, we post uh, stuff on Instagram all the time. And there was one post where we talked about cash flow. Uh, we all know that good buzzword. And somebody somebody wrote a little note. He says, you mean after everything's paid off for the month, you're supposed to have money left over? It's like, yeah, that's the whole point. You know, he says, you include taxes and insurance and water bill on that too. It's like, yeah, you do. So unfortunately, especially in this time in the market, there are so many super tight deals. I mean, if you're going to live in a property, it's different. If it's your first one, it might not be that bad. But you and I both know there's all these small expenses that add up and people think they're going to make all this killer amount of money. And you really don't. That first triplex that we bought at the bottom of the market, we lost money the first five years on that property. Hmm. It was definitely a learning experience and not because we had done anything specifically wrong. We bought it for, the numbers are going to sound low now and every market's different. This is 10 years ago. We bought it for 129000 Okay. And the average rent for all three units combined was about $1,900 a month. Wow. So obviously... That is supposed to make money. It's a no-brainer. But when you figure in, especially the first few years, the CapEx, you know, the, the first year it was vacant, you know, for a few months to start. And then you had small rehabs of each unit. And then the next year you had a new roof. The next year we had a new driveway. 
The next year we had, and, and by, by the way, with the new driveway, uh, they actually hit the pipe for the sewer line, backed up the sewer. Um, the next year we just had a, a, a bad eviction. So it, it took a few years, but that doesn't mean we're going to give up. We got it for a, a great price. And every year rents go up a little bit. Expenses go up a little bit too, but the mortgage starts to get paid down. And uh, after after a few years, you really you start to see that cash flow. Um, I have a problem when people keep telling me they're going to get cash flow on day one. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that especially in this market, it is super hard. Yeah. So it, when you're understanding the the dynamics in the market, I think that's something that's really important. It's something that also comes with experience. You said a couple of things that really resonated with me. Number one, part of the reason that I'm in real estate or real tangible assets, because I, I say real estate, but I, I like to do a lot of other things just like like you. Um, but one of the things is I lost 33% of my stock portfolio. And that was the second time it happened to me in 2008. It had happened before, not as drastic in 2000, and then it happened again in 2008. And that really got me, I was like, I've got to figure out other things to do. And so that is when that little purple book came across my life. And then a couple of years later, I actually took action because I was in analysis paralysis. But also my very first deal, I don't tell this a lot, but since you mentioned it earlier, my very first deal, like living in Spain, I bought a property back in, in the States. It was a small duplex, ended up buying it for, uh, I think it was 77. It was on the market for like 96. I bought it for 77, uh, put $20,000 into it because we had to fix it up and stuff and ended up renting it out at $1,400 a side. And so that really started as a really positive experience, but then other things started happening, right? As you mentioned before, and then you start taking that into consideration, like, wow, okay, the, there are these other things that are going to continue to happen. But all in all, when you recognize that the overall experience is a positive one, it continues to help, help you to go out and figure out, okay, what can I learn? What can I do better the next time, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I appreciate you sharing those types of um, opportunities or like, like learning experiences with us. But there's also another thing that we love to talk about here on the, on the Going Long podcast, Frank, which is, well, going long, right? And so one of the things that I really uh, appreciate about you and where you c continue to evolve, you mentioned Rhode Island and, and you know, maybe you own everything in Rhode Island, but something <laughs> I have this sneaky suspicion also too, because you and I talked about this already, that you have also gone against conventional wisdom. Because when we read most of the books and we're talking about real estate, the books say, you know, be a landlord and buy where you live so you can be there really quickly and you can take care of things. You can keep your costs down. You fundamentally decided to go beyond your backyard. You've decided to go long. And I'm always curious as to like, why would you ever make the decision to invest beyond your backyard as it relates to real estate or, or any type of tangible assets? So, yeah, um, Rhode Island, I invested 100% in Rhode Island for the first eight years of my real estate journey. But um, you know how you, people always say the grass is always greener somewhere else? Well, I, I love Rhode Island as a place, but I just don't like the government and the politics and the taxes and, and all the other things. I mean, they're, they're not as pro-growth as other parts of the country. So over time, what I realized is that I have to be in other markets to get the opportunity of growth. Okay, I, Rhode Island is not growing in population. They're not growing as an economy, but other places it are. So what did I see? I saw Atlanta in like, I remember I flew to Atlanta in maybe 2009 and I saw all these large empty apartment complexes. I saw a real bottom of the market mm -hmm. and I saw strips of houses being built where they just dropped the hammers one day and they were all like partially built. It was amazing. And I didn't take that opportunity when I should have, because now that's a real vibrant economy. Prices have tripled there, everything else. Rhode Island has grown, but it hasn't been that, that much of a growth, you know, so it would, it would hold me back. So what did I do? I, I looked at places that had job growth. I looked at places that were more pro, um, pro business, pro real estate. And I, I went out there and I figured, you know what? At some point, we're going to have a drop in the economy. We're going to have some kind of recession. Am I buying high here? Yeah. Am I buying high there? Yes. But as everything drops, I feel that those places have an opportunity to grow quicker. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Rhode Island has always had the concept of being one of the first states in recession and one of the last states out of recession. So going to other places, it just gives me the same opportunity or better opportunities. So uh, I started about two and a half years ago and started selling off my single family portfolio. Um, because you and I both know that single families, while they're nice, in certain markets, they don't cash flow that well. So especially houses that I had bought, you know, a hundred, 125,000 that were now worth 250. It's like, are they really going to cash flow? So what I did is I went to, um, I went to Texas, uh, Idaho, uh, but not necessarily the hottest markets. I'm not a fan of Dallas. I'm not a fan of Houston. Uh, I wouldn't buy Atlanta right now just because, especially with the competition, um, I'm thinking about who my competition is. And a lot of those competition can bring all cash and buy a hundred unit property. But if I can go to the secondary markets or even the tertiary markets that are still growing and, and go in and find a true deal off market, stuff like that. And I, we have done a few, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. There are definitely a lot of, uh, there are always opportunities in the marketplace. It's just a matter of number one, where are you wanting to go? And more importantly, what benefit is it that you're looking to, to derive? And then find the location that will allow you to get the best opportunity to do that. And whether that's a primary, secondary, or tertiary market, well, everybody's different in that regard. And it's got you have to be clear on what it is that you want to be able to do. There was one other thing that I wanted to mention to you about that first property, because you said something else that really resonated with me. Like one of the things living here in Europe, in different places, like different specific cities that I've looked at in Europe, not just Europe in general, but most of the markets like it was it's not uncommon and i have friends here that buy properties and it's negative cash flow and the thought concept is well we're just going to keep we're going to keep paying because it's only 100 euros it's only 200 euros a month and eventually we're going to sell it and get our money back and i'm like but it's an investment so why would you pay monthly if it's supposed to pay you like the whole concept of an investment is that it pays you maybe every month maybe every quarter maybe every year whatever but not that you pay for the, um, not that you pay for the actual, I can't even say asset, right? Because <laughs> it's not, because it's, it's a not, liability. It's not, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a <laughs> liability. So it actually felt weird even trying to say that. So, um, so the fact that you also saw that and probably still see that to some extent today is one of those things that's really, really uh, interesting. Have um, you played the game Cashflow 101, the board game? Yeah. So, and po probably most people that if you're watching the video version, like here, like right where my finger's pointing, you can see a number of those games. Yes. I oh, a, I see it. Yeah. I am a huge fan of Cashflow 101. I play Cashflow, Cashflow for kids with my children. I do and, too. And in any way that we can have that process, because it is one of the best ways to really, um, in my opinion, help people to learn about really money and investing. But, but what, what, what were you going to ask? Go ahead. Well, because you think about some of those properties that say they have a negative return and it's more of a risk, especially if you're starting the game with one of the occupations that don't pay, that don't pay well on the income side. Yep. It's like, if you're only making $800 a month in positive cash flow, do you really want to, can you afford to buy a property you're going to lose $100 a month on? Yeah. You know? Now, at the same point, if you're big enough and over time and you can take a risk here or there, you can diversify and you might be able to do it. But overall, the concept is, yeah, the point is to make money on these deals. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, and that's one of the things I love that the cash flow game does is it gives you a context because just to your point, depending on the context of the individual, the moment in the game and all these kinds of things, it may make sense or it may not. Typically, you're not going to buy something that you have to pay into every month but there could be circumstances that are a little bit different. So it, here, the, we'll, we'll also too, uh, and I love this game. I could talk about this game forever, but let's get back to you and the things that you, that you love doing. And I know that you have this huge passion for like finding creative investment opportunities and helping other people to see them. And, and I'm always curious, like for, for people that love to be able to do this kind of stuff and have a passion for it, like where does that come from for you, Frank? Um, I think it always came from my background in teaching. Uh, and just the whole just concept of me enjoying business. Uh, you always, I guess I'm a, a very positive person. So when people keep telling me no, it's like, well, how can we get around this? I mean, what can we do creatively to solve this problem? Um, my, my wife says I'm too positive sometimes. Uh, I kind of see that more of a that possible? I was going to say, is yeah. that possible? I don't think that's even possible. <laughs> I love you know, positive people. 
Yeah. So, so basically, uh, w- when you have a deal, I mean, do I say no a lot? Absolutely. You have to, yeah. but at the same point, uh, even in rich dad, poor dad, he talks about it in the book, you know, you can say just, there's no way to do something or this, you can't afford it or how can I, I can afford, afford it? it. Yep. So that, that, how can I do it? You know, can I buy a property for $4 million? Absolutely. Is it a good price? No. But is there something that I can str- strategically or creatively structure it in a way to make it work for me? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, and I love you just said that, like that, that home costs $4 million. Can I buy that? Yes. How? Well, by paying a dollar a year for the next 4 million years. And then it's there all fine, you, you know, as long as the term's right. Then we agree on it. They, hey, why not? This is uh, this is what we're gonna do. So, um, so that's helpful. And and also too, I can understand that from the education background and just that that training. You also did something that's I would consider to be very unique. And for those individuals that like in the very beginning, or they've seen the headline of this, or they just know you and they're following, they're listening. Like to go from someone who is a teacher, a secondary school teacher to becoming an accredited investor and working with other accredited investors and probably sophisticated investors along the way. Like that's not a path that most people would even consider if they're a secondary school teacher. So for what, what you can share with us, Frank, would you just kind of help us to understand what you did to be able to go about getting to that, um, that path? Because there's certain, I'm sure that there are other people that are like you, they're thinking, man, if I just knew someone that I could understand or hear their story or whatever, I know that I feel like that can be me, but it just, I don't know anybody. So maybe by you sharing the the part of your story you want to would help someone else. So basically, I mean, the average teacher is very risk averse, just like the average economist. (laughs) While they talk about things, they're they're relatively risk averse. You know, they have a lot of money in bonds, et cetera. Uh, They're looking more for the guarantee, but, if you're in a type of job that has a pretty that's pretty stable and you really don't see the chance of losing it, you really need to take more risks out there. Okay. It's that risk taking that leads to success. Mm. Are you gonna fall down once in a while? Yeah. Um, I didn't even tell you about my first deal. That that was my first multifamily deal. My first deal is I bought some vacant land out in Western Mass and lost twenty thousand dollars on it. You know, uh wow. you, Yeah, I I wouldn't say I'm a crazy risk taker either, but it gets to the point where you don't know what you don't know and you learn so much by taking those risks. Mm. I mean, we did a uh, new construction about four or five years ago. Sounded like easy money, this and that. Well, I mean... I, my partner, I made sure that she made some money on it, but I virtually broke even on it. I learned a heck of a lot. Uh, It's definitely not as easy as I thought it was going to be. And, uh, but it was, it was, well, it was worth it to take the risk. You know, and that's how we grow. Um, you'll find strategies. You'll find you'll gain expertise, and uh, the next time we may do it again. I mean, we're working on uh, two vacant lots right now. We we'd love to do a new construction on it, but at the same point, we're buying it cheaper. We're pre-planning what the prices of the new construction is going to be, and we're thinking about how long it's going to take. How long do we have to hold it with those um, sometimes crazy property taxes in the town we're looking in? You know. It, well, so yeah, so what, but what I hear you saying there, Frank, is although you may have lost 20 grand in your very first deal, right, that opportunity really helped you to be more aware, wiser as you started to purchase other types of land since then. Questions to ask, things to do, things to be aware of. Absolutely. Would, would that be accurate? Yeah. And I wouldn't necessarily call it like a, a college education or a degree in something like some people would, but, um, I'm just trying to talk about from being a teacher, you got to do something with your money and you can just let it sit there in the stock market, et cetera. But what, what I want to do is I, I want to take the opportunity since I knew I could teach for the next 30 years at the time. And I, I had some type of a pension uh, and, or, and I had a little bit of a, like a, what they call 401k or 403b, mm-hmm. uh, a type of retirement plan. I had the opportunity to take other money and risk it. And I did. A lot of my, a lot of the teacher friends I know never did. And now they're, some of them are are stuck. They're in a job where they're no longer happy about it, but they haven't put the money to work to, to, to do anything else to leave that job. 
You know what I mean? So now they're hurting themselves. I'm not saying they're hurting the kids in any way, but they're, they're definitely hurting themselves. And, uh, I, I wish they would. I, I wish they would have taken the chance. It's too. It's. I'm not saying it's too late for them now, but they they'd have to want to grow that passion from almost like scratch and, and get started. You know. So I'd give them advice. Uh, I'll say, hey, listen, read this book. Come back and see me. And there's a lot of times that we go through, and I help people. I sit down with people every single week, trying to help them invest in real estate, et cetera. So. So what do you think is the, and it, it may be a super obvious question for you, but there's a lot of other people that are thinking, well, well, yeah, but they just need to take action. Like, what do you think is the biggest thing holding them back from actually moving forward or even just finding out more about the opportunity? So, so back to school, we have very much a fear of failure. These people are, are mostly school teachers. If, you know, uh, getting an F in a class is one of the worst things you can possibly do. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's that whole fear of failure. It's like, no, you have to, you have to take risks and failure's okay once in a while. I'm not talking about jumping off a cliff. Uh, I'm talking about jumping off something that's two feet, you know, start small, build it, gain knowledge, take risks. That's how you grow. That's how you're successful in anything. You and I both know this. And uh, I wish I could get more people to see it. Uh, one of the greatest things we could have is every single person that graduates school have their own small business started. Mm. We definitely do not promote that at all. I did. Um, I had when I had extra time, I taught my kids in school about stocks and and starting their own businesses. And we've actually had a few of them start their businesses. You know, little cool things like that. No, and that's a brilliant idea to be able to have that. I mean, can you imagine if everyone did have their own little business and it would make a lot of things like crystal clear for people? Um, but I also, too, I want to just kind of pick up on one of the things that you just mentioned, because I know you do something that's a, a some people would say it's a bit. Mm, it goes against what people that are in the alternative space will do. I tend to think if you know how to do things, everything is a tool. And I know that you have been able to find a combination of not just quote unquote alternative assets, but also the traditional more like stocks. And you've been able to combine them to also help you get to build the lifestyle that you want. So maybe talk about that a little bit, because it may be a little bit controversial for some people. I don't think it is, but. So, so basically, I mean, I believe in diversification. So I have, on the real estate side, I have smaller multifamilies locally. I have larger multifamilies nationally. I have some lending opportunities. I, I've, I've loaned out money, mostly on real estate. I've loaned it to a few small businesses. Uh, I own uh, a couple small businesses, like uh, my virtual assistant business. Uh, I have, I don't know, uh, higher six figures in stocks. Uh, you got to be out there. I have a little bit of crypto, not much, just because it's a, it's a hedge. It's it's mm -hmm. a way to it's a way to hold assets. You, you got to spread it around. Um, if you put all your money, it's like putting all your money on black uh, and gambling. Uh, there's there's an easy way that if you're wrong, uh, am I wrong every single day? But uh, that's why I diversify enough that I can. If one goes bad, the other ones will hold it up. Yeah, no, and that makes sense. And you know, and I think this is the. This is the part that's really important because every single person has different goals. Every single person is at a different phase in life. And so if you've experienced success, well, why not replicate that? And so whether each one of these vehicles is a tool, and if you understand how to use the tool, then there's a higher probability that you will get the result that you're looking for, which I think is uh, great. And many times, you know, we don't want to completely bash um the stocks, but I, you know, I don't, I'm not a big believer in them. Although I do have some because I, I bet early on and I've been really, really lucky with those bets and I've just kind of ridden them out. But where I put my time, my energy is, is completely somewhere else nowadays. Um, yeah. And I still have stocks and I still invest in stocks. Uh, I put money in every single, uh, every single week or two weeks, you know, a little bit, just, you know, call it do uh, dollar cost averaging, et cetera, because it's, it's a passive way to uh, invest in somebody else's business, basically. Hmm. I mean, there are benefits to stocks. Uh, basically, you got people working 24 seven in Amazon. If you invest in Amazon, those people are working for you a little bit as well. Hmm. If you have money in Apple, money in Walmart, I mean, those companies wanna make a profit and they're sharing it with you because you're a small partner. Now at the same point in real estate, the reason why I like it is, 
is this, this better opportunities for me. So if you have two stocks that are the same company, there's not really diversification. They're both the same company. They're both worth the same amount of money. But I can have two houses in the same street and I can change one. I can fix it. I can add a, add a garage. I can raise the rent. I can change the value of it. You know, so there's a lot of different opportunities for it. I have, I have a lot of ways to improve what I can do. I can only buy so many bottles of Sprite at Walmart. It's not going to affect the share price of Walmart, but I, I can greatly affect uh, things going on in the properties that I own. Yeah, definitely makes sense. And, but you know, before we get into the, the going long final three, Frank, you mentioned something earlier, and I know as a business owner, you look to go out and solve problems and you have been able to solve one specifically with your uh, virtual assistant company. So maybe tell us a little bit about that, what you're, what you're doing there, what was the genesis of that and how you're helping other business owners today? Sure. So the name of the company is Real Agent Helper. We have a website, we have Instagram, we're on Facebook, everywhere else. And uh, basically, I wanted a way to help my real estate friends. And uh, I have a buddy, his name is Pedro, he's my partner on it. And he's a world traveler. Um, even during COVID, he's been to uh, three three countries in the last uh, six months, you know. Um, and before COVID, he was in 18 countries in three months. He wanted uh, a real lifestyle change. And we figured out a way to help others um, increase their productivity. And uh, basically what we do is we hire um, employees from different countries, Argentina, the Philippines, India, and others. And uh, we link them up with uh, some of our investors here in the United States. And they might do a ton of different things for them. We have property management companies that use our employees as full-time staffing for all their phone calls, secretarial support. We have others that use them more for social media. And basically, we're just helping. I mean, all the big companies are doing it. Uh, if you call the Visa card or if you call Walmart or you call anybody, you're probably talking to a VA somewhere. And then over time, we're trying to help the small businessmen do the same thing. And they love it. Um, we have people that have been with us for years. We have employees that have been with us for years. And we're just like the, we're like the, the middleman. We, we, we make a small percentage uh, in between. We actually, we don't make a big profit on it. It's all about relationships. Um, everybody uh, that I work with just about, I have a relationship with them and I still have a relationship with them. So not only are they using our business, but I might be a client of theirs for something else. It's like those, like I said, with the high school, with everybody getting out of school with a small business, we work together, we network, we promote each other. It's great. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you giving us some insight there for, uh, for your, for that business. Cause you were looking once again to solve problems for others and also as you mentioned, this is really also one of the ways that you can build relationships uh, as a as a byproduct of being able to provide a service, which is fantastic. And so the thing is, like Frank, we got to get into go, the going long final three, man. And the thing is, I never ask anybody the going long final three unless they tell me that they're ready for me to ask them. So my question for you, Frank, is: Are you ready? I am always ready for another test. You were born <laughs> ready for tests. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a test though, man. These are just, you know the answers of these already. No, listen. So here's the first question. And we started with you over on your side of the pond. And now we're going to bring it back to my adoptive side of the pond over here in Europe. And I would love for you to share with the Going Long family. What is your favorite European city that you've either visited or are still on your bucket list to visit? So I have not been to a European city yet. Um, I did spend a little, I flew over Europe to go to Egypt um, before, but uh, besides that, I would try to go to Naples, Italy, would be the first place I'd go, only because of my Italian last name, um, I would like to uh, go find some family. There's a little island called Yiska right off the coast of uh, Naples. And uh, at one point, my grandfather had a, a vineyard there. So uh, I wouldn't, I'm, I know there's a lot of people with the same last name out there and uh, we'd be probably second or third cousins. So it'd be pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful city. We were supposed to go uh, this year, but with COVID, it didn't work out. Well, it'd be next year. So that's fine. So yeah, yeah. Just, uh, let, let me know because I have some, uh, have some family members over that way. So uh, oh, nice. maybe, maybe we can catch up. Uh, perfect. So listen, so this is the, the, the next question of the Go Along Final Three has to do with really successful people. And I usually get nervous before this question because the whole thing is like, one thing, and, and Frank, you're a very successful person. Like one of the things with really successful people is 
that makes them different is that successful people like throughout their whole trajectory have only made one mistake. And by only having made one mistake, I tell myself all the time and I get it wrong every single time. All right, well, maybe that's by design a little bit. So no, here's the thing. So the, the whole thing with successful people is they're like everybody else. They make mistakes, errors, learning opportunities, whatever you want to call them, but they do something differently. And that is they really, rather than get stuck in the mistake, they take away the lesson and they apply it. And you've kind of talked about some things already, but I'm wondering if you could just share one lesson that you've learned that really made a huge impact on you that could make a huge impact on the Going Long family today. So I'm not sure how many people it's going to help in the family, but just uh, an example was... uh, when you're investing in a property, especially one that you have to do major changes to, uh, like zoning changes or, or complete rehab, stuff like that, if you're doing that, make sure that the, the municipality, the city or town is on board. <laughs> I didn't even talk about that story, but I mean, there's, there's been a few times where we've bought properties with these dreams, these ideas in order to do these amazing things to it. And we've been completely shut down yeah. by whoever's the powers that be, um, whole groups of neighbors ready to um, tar and feather us, et cetera. Make sure that they are on board. Now, at the same point, we've done some where everybody is super happy because it was in really bad condition and it was really a detriment to the neighborhood. But sometimes some people are stuck in their own ways. We have a lot of nimbyism in this area, you know, not in my own backyard, you know, so, but that's just one. I mean, there's, there's tons of different lessons. Uh, I was, I laughed when you first started and then you pause. It's like, I make mistakes every single day, every single week. And one of the things I tell people is that, if you're not making mistakes, you're not taking enough risks in life. Yeah, agreed. 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 Yeah, you got to push yourself outside the comfort zone. And usually that means you're going to bump the knee a little bit every once in a while. And it, 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 the whole thing is what, what happens afterwards. So, yeah, definitely make sure that you're aligned with your local municipalities, especially those that <clears throat> could, well, could hold up your projects or put them on hold or put them like away forever. So yeah, shut them down, shut them down. So listen, Frank, so here's the thing. So the very last of the going long final three really has to do with feeding our minds with uh, more knowledge. And so would love for you to share uh, one book uh, with the going long family. What would that book recommendation be for us? Wow. There's, there's so many that I could give, but uh, I'm going to give seven habits of highly effective people. By uh, Covey, Mr. Stephen R. Covey, Covey. yeah, Mr. Yeah. Stephen R. Covey, yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like if that. you, if you, if it's okay, I'd like to tell a story about it. Yeah, sure, go right ahead. Um, so he has a book that he wrote with his son called "The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens," and I read it with my uh, sixth graders about five or six years ago when I was teaching. We had a class that we were um, trying to uh, give some lessons. And I didn't pick the book, but somebody else did. And uh, I wouldn't say that book changed my life, but it, it did help a lot and made things easier. You know, you, it's, about bu- it's about building habits. And uh, I love that book so much that from that time, every year that I taught from then on, um, I, read this, I read the same book to those kids. And uh, I think it really helped a lot. And uh, I, I, I just hope that, uh, that the people that I inspired have uh, really been able to be successful and, and worked with that. Well, that's a that's a great story. I appreciate you sharing that with us, Frank. And uh, we'll also make sure that all of your answers get in the uh, in the show notes so that the, everyone that is listening and or watching has access to those uh, pretty quickly. So, man, Frank, these conversations go by like super fast, man. And I and I'm just thinking about from the very beginning, like you're you're sharing with us, when, which I thought was really interesting that you went to college for business. And then you ended up going and moving into education, but actually education has opened up your world for many, many businesses, which I think is absolutely fantastic kind of way to think about how these, how these things happen in life. And then from there, really, you know, you, you've had some bumps and bruises along the way. You mentioned losing 33%, and then you've also been able to get things started. You had a really clear plan. You knew what it was that you wanted to do year after year that you wanted to make sure that you were purchasing. You also recognize that at a certain point you had to take some calculated risks. And I added that calculated part, but because if you just continue to do the same things, and this is me adding once again, you're going to get the results that you always have been been getting up until that point. So having taken that risk and continuing to um, go out, to learn, to, to, to get educated, to get 
feedback, not always things working perfectly. I mean, you were very open and honest and sharing those things with us. But in spite of that, you continue to move forward because you were clear on the goal and the benefit that you wanted to be able to get. And you don't have a fear of failure, which is one of the things that I know like so many people are like, wow, this guy's done all this stuff and he's continued to build businesses. He's got this really cool VA company. He's moving and working with accredited, non-accredited investors. He's investing actively, passively. Like people want to know more about this guy who's from Rhode Island. So help us understand, Frank, what is the best way for the entire Going Long family to be able to reach out to you and find out more about you, your businesses and how you're helping other people? So we'll give you an A for your summary. That was good. Uh, uh, the easiest way to find uh, me, I am all over social media, but if you go to The Cashflow Kings, uh, especially on Instagram, uh, that's where we, we spend a lot of time. We have about uh, just under 14,000 followers there. We post every day, no matter what. Uh, why I could have VAs do it, I like to do it myself. Um, I, I like to be, that's, that's the place that I, I, am, I am most me. So uh, that's where you'll see a lot of the posts. I have a partner on it. It's not just me, uh, Jimmy Murray. He owns his own property management business as well. And we don't even make a ton of money from the Cash Flow Kings. It's just, it's just out there. It's giving out information. It's just us building. It's about relationships and connections. We found deals through it. Uh, we've built great relationships with other parts of the country from it, stuff like that. Which is awesome. So I I knew you from the Cashflow Kings before I actually met you. So the Cashflow Kings over on Instagram. And yeah, you guys have a, a great presence there and and doing a lot uh, of things there. And I would also say, because we have a lot of people here that reach out on on LinkedIn. I know it's maybe not your necessarily your, perform plat, your preferred platform, but for the Going Along family, if when you reach out to Frank, make sure that you heard it, let him know that you heard him here. So don't just like send him like this random connection notice, like let him know, like personalized. Hey, Frank heard you on the going long podcast with Billy. Love what you were talking about, blah, blah, blah. So that will help Frank also probably make a quicker connection with you there. And then you guys can continue to talk over on Instagram, but just some of us tend to move over towards LinkedIn. So yeah, no, was, LinkedIn is, is, is the main way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but we just like it. Uh, we're going for a younger crowd than you are, don't forget. So that's why. I mean, yeah, we yeah. have a TikTok saved and everything else. We don't post on it much, but we're always busy. All the, okay, all the new social media is always starting out. It's like, do I want to get involved in that? Do I want to get involved? You got to make choices. Yeah, yeah, choices. That's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. So um, well, listen, Frank, I just want to thank you very much, man. I appreciate you investing your time with me and the entire Going Along family and getting a, giving us the opportunity to get to know you more and better. Thank you. Thank you, sir. When are you coming back to the States? Oh, well, that's, uh, well, that's kind of one of the things. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Hopefully sometime soon, but I was there not too long ago. So uh, oh, nice. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, de I'll definitely let you know. The big meeting is starting to open up. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're starting to give me calls. Hey, do you want to go here in July? Hey, do you want to go here in October? <laughs> Stuff like that. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we connect that way. But uh, awesome. if you give me just a couple seconds, Frank, I just want to say a couple last words to the Going Along family really quickly. And want to thank you, Going Along family, for investing your time with Frank and I today. I mean, Frank, let's look, I mean, the guy went from being a secondary school teacher, followed his dream and continues to go out and make an impact on people's lives positively. I mean, it was just fantastic, very actionable insights. And so, you know what? You have a unique opportunity to take today's conversation and share it with like two other, two or three other people. You know, someone that would love to hear Frank's story, would make really a good connection. And at the same time, you're going to bring other like-minded people towards the, the Going Along family, which is something that we like to do as well to continue to grow our family with other like-minded people. And at the same time, if you could take just a couple seconds and leave us an honest written review, like let us know what you thought about today's conversation, what you'd love to hear what we, in the future, or just about the podcast in general. You know, this is something that I go through each one of the comments because I want to continue to work to make sure that the podcast is delivering exactly what it is that you want us to deliver the value you want us to deliver and also to be able to attract really cool guests like Frank. So take a couple seconds just to leave that honest review. And listen, until then, I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back on the very next conversation. So until then, go out, make it a great day. And thank you very much. Freedom. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. 
So go out and make it a great day.